This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Wonderful. So a big thank you to everyone for joining our statewide <coughs> advocacy session. This is the opportunity for the Vermont Creative Network and the Arts Council to share our sector priorities for the session. Uh, we really appreciate your support of the Vermont Creative Network and the creative economy. We have a very specific kind of session this year that Patty's going to talk about, which is really historic, so much change happening. And Christopher is going to talk with us about the creative economy and making sure that we're messaging correctly with legislators and the purpose of the VCN. I want to start by also thanking our closed captioner, Diane, for joining us. If you would like a live closed caption that's available today, we will also be making sure that the event is closed captioned afterwards for all recording. And we will also share the recording on our website and via email after the event. Wow. I like to make sure that at the Arts Council, we start with a land acknowledgement. And this is something that we do for all VCN events and Arts Council events. So as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today and likely those of you who are calling in from the traditional and unsurrendered territory of the Abenaki people in the state we now call Vermont. And I'd like to offer this land acknowledgement. The Vermont Arts Council recognizes that we live and gather here in traditional Abenaki lands and it's the traditional and unsurrendered homeland of the Abenaki people. One of five Wabanaki nations who have had continual presence here since time immemorial. Thank you for joining us here today. Today we have Patty Comline from DRM, who is our lobbyist in the Vermont legislature, as well as Chris Rolstrup, who is our partner at the Vermont Humanities Council and is a key player on the Vermont Creative Network's steering team and has been an amazing partner for our work. We're gonna make sure today to cover some of the key lay of the land of the Vermont legislature this year. Again, huge turnover, lots of changes and some of our key priorities as well as how we're gonna engage. Um, Patty or Christopher, is there anything that I'm missing from your introductions that you would like to say? No, I think you've got it. All good. Okay, great. I am a white woman that's very flushed pink right now from the heat and uh, has a red sweater on with a gray background and a painting directly behind me. And I am really happy to be joining you from the Vermont Arts Council offices today in Montpelier. Thank you so much for having me. Now that we've dug in and I've sped us through the start here, Patty, would you like to start by giving us a solid lay of the land of the Vermont legislature this year? And what I'll do is go ahead and share my screen so that you can make Thank sure. Because I am technically challenged and was afraid I would mess that up. So I appreciate that. I'll also say that I have a, unfortunately, I tend to talk very quickly. I have a big note here to myself that says talk slowly. But if any of you, if I start ramping up and going too quickly, Johanna, just, you know, give me the, that's what the people around me tend to do. It's not an offensive thing. Just let me know, please just slow down a little bit. So if you want to start sharing those slides, what I'm going to do is give you just the legislative landscape post-election and then that'll be a good segue into Christopher talking about your priorities. Okay. So if you're ready to share those slides. I am. Give me one second. I also will say, I was saying to Joanna, I'm at my parents' house in Texas. So in the background, you'll see hanging on the wall, some weaponry. It's not a reflection of my decorating taste, but uh, I am in Texas. So um, it could be worse. That's wonderful. Can okay. everyone see the DRM slides that are here on my screen now? So this is just my opening slide that just says who we are and this is made for all of you. It's the first slide. Nope, that's fine. You can go to the next slide. So uh, this is the congressional elections. Uh, the UN, this, there was no, there were no surprises here really for anybody. Uh, for US Senate, it was Peter Welch, one handily was 66.8% of the vote. Gerald Malloy, who we ran against was a right wing Republican who actually kind of it shouldn't have been surprising. It was surprising to some that he beat Christine Nolan in a primary. She was far more moderate. And um, so now we just lost the slides. There you go, thanks. Um, but so then when Gerald Malloy came in, Peter Welch had an even easier race. Uh, he's 75 years old. Uh, moving through the Senate to get power takes time uh, as seniority counts. Uh, Peter is 75. 
Uh, Bernie Sanders is 81, so we do have a very senior um, delegation there in the Senate. U.S. House, our rock star Becca Ballin, one with 60 percent against Liam Madden, who is an interesting character who said, even though he's running as a Republican, he's really an independent. He didn't realize he could fund as an independent, made some other interesting, colorful decisions like having his three-year-old son donate to his campaign so that he could qualify for debates. Um, I don't know. Interesting guy. Uh, Becca is the rock star. I do believe she's celebrities are going to really take interest in her as well. We're going to see her grow quickly. She was just uh, elected into some leadership uh, position for the freshman class. So I think you're going to see her trajectory really move up quickly. We're excited to have her there. So that's our congressional results. And then moving on to the next slide. I'm going to go over the state level at the, the state elections. Yes. Yeah, so Phil Scott, Phil Scott is the most popular governor in America. He usually is neck and neck with Charlie Baker, Massachusetts. Charlie Baker sought not to run for re-election. He was replaced by a Democrat first woman, first openly gay um, woman uh, for governor in Massachusetts. So I think that by default makes Phil Scott unequivocally the most popular governor. 68.8% of the vote. Uh, he beat Brenda Siegel with 23%. Um, Phil just is very, I mean, he's not, by most people's estimation, he's not a Republican. He tends, he's very, he's an independent, let's face it. He doesn't attend uh, Republican. The Republicans in the state actually try to oust him. So um, he's got the title. Uh, Dave Zuckerman beat Joe Benning uh, with 51% of the vote. Uh, Dave Zuckerman ran in a, a strong primary against Kitty Toll, um, and he, she, there were a few other people that were more aligned with Kitty's politics. They split the vote. So Dave Zuckerman won the primary and then quickly assumed the, took on the progressive title after that primary. So he's a progressive Democrat, beat Joe Benning. Joe had a much stronger numbers there than if Kitty had run. Um, a lot of people that are more mainstream Democrats didn't want to vote for someone who's a progressive who's running in a Democratic primary. Um, so that's the results for the lieutenant governor. Mike Pichek is our treasurer, really didn't have a, a race. Uh, everybody loves Mike. A lot of people feel like he'll be next in line to run for governor, a favorite. Sarah copeland Hanses for secretary of state. Doug Hopper, state auditor, and our attorney general, Charity Clark. Again, all of them had very easy races into these finals. And they're all, well, with the exception of Doug Hopper, they're new in their positions. So that was our statewide elections. So state legislative races. On the left, you'll see a little chart there is the House. Uh, in 2021, the Democrats had, here's where we're going to work on going slowly. The Democrats had 92 seats. The progressives or progressive slash Democrats had seven seats. There were five independents and 46 Republicans. That was in 2021. The incoming year, the Democrats will have 104 seats. The progressives, five, the independents, three, and the Republicans have dropped down to 38. This is significant because with 104 um, votes, the Democrats will be able to override any veto that the governor decides to make. And he was not shy with his veto pen. So we expect the Democrats will have a strong push in both actually the House and the Senate. Um, there was an article written about the progressives losing um, influence or losing because they dropped down two seats. Actually, that's not the case. A number of progressives, uh, there's a lot of what they call PDs or DPs, Democrat progressives. Uh, three progressives dropped their P and they're going, they're, they're Democrats, but really their values have not changed. They just want to be considered more for leadership positions. So the Democrats have really successfully infiltrated um, or assimilated into their, uh, I should say the progressive, into the Democratic Party. Um, but the, that drop for Republicans is is big. Um, on the Senate side, in the next column, you'll see Senate side. In 2021, the Democrats had 21 seats. The progressives had two and the Republicans had seven. And the only difference this year is the Democrats picked up one and the progressive lost one. But ag again, I mean, even the incoming pr pr uh, pro tem, the head of the Senate, I mean, he's a Democrat progressive, so it is a very left-leaning legislature, even though you know a lot of those Democrats there definitely lean left. And below those charts, you'll see, it's like there's a colorful seating chart filled with colorful circles. Uh, it's a semicircle, um, like a half a donut, 
and you'll see a lot of blue dots representing the Democrats. You'll see fewer red dots representing the Republicans and then the off color ones are the, I shouldn't say off color, <laughs> but the independents and the um, progressives are in gold and yellow. So that's that slide. And next to focus on Senate changes, there are 10 new senators, a new pro tem. There'll be three new chairs at a minimum. There will be in commerce, government operations and institutions. Uh, th those are commerce and institutions are significant for the arts and creative sector. Uh, they were, we worked very closely with commerce last year. Uh, I believe Keisha Rahm Hinsdale will be chair there. Institutions was Joe Benning, where we don't know who is going to replace him yet. Uh, we have a note here of notable winners. Mark McDonald in Orange County uh, was struck ill near the uh, election cycle. He had a stroke. Uh, his the, the guy running against him, John Clark, ran a very strong campaign, but Mark McDonald won. Uh, Republicans swept, swept Rutland. And interesting, this notable defeat says Irene Renner. So, so in redistricting in Chittenden County, there was one seat that was kind of carved out that the Republicans all were sure was going to be theirs. Democrats were sure it was going to be Republicans as well. It was this seat. Uh, Lila Morgan ran against Irene Renner uh, by by rumor. I, I do not live up there, but Lila Morgan assumed he was going to get that seat. He did not participate in debates. I, Irene Renner worked very hard, got around to doors, was everywhere, and she won. So that is a notable defeat for the Republicans. And the next slide will go over the House changes, which are much more significant. There are 49 new House members. That's a third. Uh, the biggest deal is there are nine, at minimum, new chairs. They may move some people around. There are very senior people, uh, mostly women that have retired that were chairs. Um, and if you look on the right, there's a column there of those new chair openings, appropriations, ways and means, agriculture, judiciary, healthcare, human services, government operations, education, and energy and technology. Uh, I, there's talk of moving one chair from one thing to another, and uh, it's been kept uh, very guarded by the pro tem. There's a picture, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, speaker, there's a picture of Jill Krawinski right there. Um, that nobody knows anything, not even the people on the committees. Uh, appropriations is a very hefty committee. Uh, they have 11 members. They have lost seven of their 11 members, including, including their chair. And why that's significant um, is it takes special talent to be a chair. Uh, you have to move 11 people who are each equally elected and have strong opinions in the same direction. Uh, taking on controversial issues is challenging. It's sometimes entertaining from our perspective. I've served on committees. I was, I was a former legislator. I've served on committees with very good chairs. I've served on committees with average chairs, and I've sat in committees with bad chairs, and um, yeah, they're inter they're entertaining, but not if you have to get things done. And and so these people, the new ones coming in, don't really even have mentors because with these senior people, you know, nine out of fourteen leaving, um, and these women that have been there a long time, mostly women again. Tim Briglin, I shouldn't say mostly women, I guess two thirds of them are women. Um, they came with a lot of experience and that is a big, big loss to the legislature. And they do know that moving anything significant is going to be tricky in the next two years. It's a big education year. Um, notable winners were Mike McCarthy, here's the former uh, assistant leader. He had a very tough, pretty nasty race and he won. Uh, Robin Chestnut Changerman is a very interesting one. He was the head of the Progressive Party, Progressive Caucus. Uh, he lost a few years ago in a close election to a Republican as progressive. The Democrats asked him if they could put his name in as a Democrat. And so in the last minute, they wrote him in um, after the primary. And so he ran as a Democrat and he won. And he's just a pleasure to work with. Kind of excited to have him back. And um, Rebecca Holcomb, former Secretary of Education, is coming in. Um, and then the notable defeat is, this one was interesting. So Vicki Strong and Catherine Sims, it was a two-seat district. They could not be more different in their, in their politics. However, they both are very well uh, connected to their communities. They have very strong constituent outreach. They're both really good people. Um, and Vicki lost. Uh, and people were watching that, that race. So Vicki, the Republican, Vicki Strong lost. Catherine Sims will go on and she's got a great legislative uh, newsletter she puts out if anybody wants that. 
And so that's the um, slide. We can go on to the next. So the impact of the elections, so the, the redistricting seemed to work well for the Democrats. And again, how productive will the legislature be? Uh, it, this is a big education year, and that's what we'll be working on. We're excited about this, you know, Vermont Creative Network Day that we're putting out. Uh, we will just be doing soft touches on, on legislators and educating them, getting into all the committees and letting all the new people know what's going on. Um, it's really important when you get elected to take things slowly. And when I got elected, I was really frustrated with that. But uh, there is a ripple effect to the decisions you make. Uh, the, the talk about the law of unintended consequences. And so taking it slow is important, listening to all parties. And with so many new people, uh, with strong ideas and energy, it's going to be interesting to see um, what's going to happen going forward, if they're just going to kind of push through the people that are more senior there. I, I, there's a brashness that's not bad. And it's very interesting to watch the young people like, you know, just because you've done it this way all the time doesn't mean it has to be done this way. So it's going to be a big shakeup. Uh, but we, we are well positioned. I've been working well with this group with Johanna and Christopher and Amy and others, Christine. So we're we're working our way into educating the legislature about the value. And I was excited to work last year on the grants. That was incredible, uh, the support that we got. And I look forward to continuing this work. And I want to thank all of you and what you do. Uh, you make you make Vermont just a vibrant place to be. Oh, and we have one more slide. Sorry, I was thinking we were done. Um, so Governor Scott, sorry, I'll go back to this. Governor Scott is the only Republican game in town out of uh, all of the races. It, he's the only Republican. Um, and there's really no where, there's no bench, which we'll say here. There's no candidates, things, uh, Republicans. Uh, he doesn't have coattails and because he's not, you know, he's not aligned with the party. So that was the governor, but the Democrats, conversely, if you go to the next slide, um, Democrats have a very deep bench. There's Mike Pichek, Jill Krowinski, Kei Hinsdale. She's going to be out there. I think she's planning on running for Congress when those slots open up. I think that's going to be her next run. Um, Molly Gray, I'm not sure if she's gone or not, if she's gone gone or she'll be back. The Kitty Toll is ready to come back and run again. Allison Clarkson is strong, Sarah Copeland Hanses, uh, and for Dave Zuckerman. I think there's a space between Dave and the others because he is the progressive Democrat. So I think, is that my last slide? Oh, legislative issues. I wasn't anywhere near finished, I'm sorry. Uh, so the legislative issues are uh, housing. Of course, everybody's aware of, of, of the challenge. There's a picture here of a house under construction. Supply chain issues are a challenge. Workforce, we lead right into that. These are all interconnected, as you all well know. Our workforce challenge, our housing challenge, early childcare. Uh, we're awaiting the details of the costs for early childcare. Um, it's going to be expensive, uh, and it's competing with other other child care issues. But uh, they're all so woven together that I don't know how they solve these problems. What happened? It's like everybody left the state during COVID, and they took their houses with them. Like all the workforce left, and they took their houses. I think a lot of it is houses switched to short term rentals, and I think maybe people. Have, well, we kind of did an unofficial poll. A lot of people because the wages went up. They're not working as many hours. If you make more than forty-four thousand dollars a year, you lose benefits and you like you lose childcare, uh, healthcare for your child. So a lot, I think many people are just not working as many hours, but they're still in the workforce, uh, particularly in the service industry. So we have to really take a deep dive on our workforce development, and you know, there's a push to try and attract more people into the state but then we have nowhere for them to live. So these are challenges. And then the uh, secondary issues, uh, there's a clean heat standard bill that was vetoed. That was a big upset last year. No doubt that is coming back. Uh, paid family leave, that's pretty much going to be in competition with early child, could, early child care for funding because they're both expensive. Universal school lunch, there was one-time money for that. That's expensive as well. And they're not going to stop that program. You're not going to stop feeding kids. So that's that's in there for contention for money. There's a big talk about income-based education tax. Again, with the turnover of the legislature, I'm not sure that's gonna be able to happen in the near future. There's a lot to learn on that. And then there's always perennial talk about permitting an Act 250 and then they never do anything. They just talk about that. So those are the le legislative issues. 
The governor always stays on message about affordability, growing the economy, protecting the most vulnerable, and housing and workforce. So they can get aligned in all these issues. Everybody in Vermont, I always found, has the same end goal. It's just the path to take it is where everyone differs. So that's the end of my slide deck. And again, I just want to backtrack and say, you make Vermont a more vibrant place to be. And especially when I'm in a place here like Texas, I appreciate all of you so much in Vermont and the value we all place on, on the arts and the creative sector. And I'm just really proud to be working with all of you. So I think I've teed that up well for you, Christopher, and talking about how you approach the priorities now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And Chris, right, I mean to catch you off, excuse me. Uh, Patty, thank you so much for that overview. I really can't underscore enough for folks uh, how much of a change in the legislature this is going to be, especially these key committees having new leadership without a lot of necessary mentorship, and how all of our bills, of course, including our budget, flow through these committees to start ensuring that we're getting really good buy-in from legislators and that they really understand what the creative economy is, is gonna go a long way, not just for this year, but for many years down the line as we've seen these huge changes. And on that note, I am actually gonna take a step back and say, Christopher, thank you so much for talking about the creative economy. Yeah, thank you, um, Johanna and um, and Patty. Thank you so much for the the kind of big picture overview. Um, I do not have a slide deck, but I am going to share a whole bunch of uh, URL links, um, and I will share my screen when I get to that. Um, and I think we can probably get all those links into the uh, into the chat so that people can find them later as well. And maybe there's a follow up email that they can go into as well. Um, but you know, the first thing that I want to say is that I really appreciate Patty your. Uh, big picture overview of the kind of the lay of the land and the importance of recognizing how many new relationships we have to create this year. Um, but but secondarily and even more important, I just want to say that um, to be able to talk about the the bigger picture issues, quote unquote, that that you talked about is very important to the creative sector and the cultural sector. Right? We are uh, folks uh, just like everybody else. We are 9% of the economy. Um, we need paid family leave. We need universal school lunch for our children. We need housing. Um, and we know that creative sector jobs tend to pay somewhat less uh, than the average wage in Vermont. So it's very likely that um, we need those things more than the average person. Um, and so I think it's it's important to us as creative sector advocates to be thinking about the broader picture and not thinking that healthcare, housing, childcare, school uh, funding issues are not part of our work. They are part of our work. And, and I think it's important that we start thinking about it that way. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to mention before we lead off um, is that there are a lot of, of members of the creative sector, people who work in our fields that are actually legislators. Um, and there, you know, some examples of that include Sarah Coffey from down in Wyndham County, Brian Chena from Chittenden County, Molly Burke, um, and of course, our, our big champion in the House last year, Stephanie Jerome, um, and uh, among the newbies, uh, Josie Levitt from, from Grand Isle uh, will be coming in. She is a stand-up comedian, a member of the LGBT community, uh, and a, a very talented community organizer and, and an artist. Um, so, you know, we have allies um, and members of our community throughout both houses. Um, and I think it's it's important to remember that too, right? Where our advocates are there um, already. So I'm going to share my screen, um, and I'm not going to talk for a super long time, maybe ten minutes, um, about some of these things, um, and then we'll save um, you know fifteen to twenty minutes for um, for conversation. Um, so the first thing that I want to make sure that everybody on this webinar knows about is the Create Vermont Action Plan, right? You probably do, but I don't want to make assumptions um, that you know about these things. I, and I'll put all the links in when we're in the Q&A period um, so that because I can't do 16 things at once. 
even though sometimes I think I can. So the Create Vermont Action Plan was created with your input, thousands of other Vermonters over the last several years. Um, it's made a splash in the community planning community, as you can see right up at the top. It was named the 2022 Plan of the Year by the Vermont Planners Association and has gone on to win accolades at regional uh, 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 competitions as well. Um, if you haven't read it, um, this is the roadmap that we're using for the next several years to determine what our advocacy strategy is for the sector. Uh, Vermont Humanities, uh, where I work, is very proud to be an endorser of the plan and a member of uh, the Vermont Creative Network. Um, we've been part of putting this together for the, the whole time. Um, and I can say that, uh, unequivocally say that I love how many voices are represented in this work. Um, literally thousands of people participated in multiple ways to put this together. Um, so uh, the first thing you should do your homework after this webinar is to go through and check this out. It is very long. Um, I will not deny that, um, but fortunately, um, it is also uh, summarized um, in an amazing um, uh, little executive summary, which you'll find right here. Um, so if you don't have time to read the 70 or 80 page plan, uh, this two page plan is a great thing to, to have sort of in your back pocket. It's also, of course, a great thing to have to hand over um, to uh, folks in the state house um, or at other gatherings that you're going to that you know explains in a nutshell um, who we are, what we're doing, and why they should care about us. Um, right. And the most the most important numbers are these top line numbers, right? 9.3% of all jobs are creative sector jobs. And that is a pretty enormous number. It's a very high number compared to other states. Um, it's a very high number in terms of raw jobs in our workforce. It's 41,000 people uh, working in creative sector jobs around the state of Vermont. Uh, so that that is a key thing to say, right? Like oftentimes people who don't know a lot about the creative sector um, who may just assume, oh, are you just talking about musicians or painters or people who make pottery? Well, yes, we are talking about that, but we're also talking about a lot more people. Um, and so collectively we have a lot of power um, and we are a significant sector. Um, in the Vermont economy. Um, we're, we're larger than many other sectors um, in Vermont. Um, flipping down to the second page um, of that, um, you'll see our both our vision and our goals and then our advocacy agenda. Um, and I'll let you, you know, read all these words on your own time. You don't have to, to listen to me read them to you, but I think the important thing for right now is our advocacy agenda that we are uh, encouraging um, the state of Vermont to invest in creative spaces and infrastructure. We are encouraging the state of Vermont to expand creative economic development to really include the creative sector in the economic development strategy. Uh, we strongly believe, getting back to the sort of wider issues that I, that I led off with and that Patty talked about, that investing in broadband and digital capacity is one of the best things we can do for creative sector uh, uh, workers in the state of Vermont. And of course, by extension, uh, having true access to broadband and digital capacity around the state for everyone um, is a critical economic development strategy across the state. Um, and then finally, uh, we strongly believe that that artists and others, all creative folks, um, need to have business skills. Um, so often those of us who are working in the creative sector, in the cultural sector, in, um, special, in the specialty foods industries, we're in it because we're passionate about what we're creating, um, but we haven't necessarily um, sought out uh, the professional development that we need to actually make a living um, and that there are real opportunities available to help um, those 41,000 folks, including myself, um, to have stronger professional development, to, to be able to advance our careers uh, and support our families. Um, so that is quite key. Um, and I urge you to, you know, spend some time with this. This is a PDF. It's easy to print out. Um, you can also get Johanna or Amy to send you copies of it um, if you want. Um, and um, it's easy to bring around and talk with people about it. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about, and pardon me, I think I'm going to have to um, shift 
a little bit here in order to get to the link because it's hiding behind the the um, the tool. Uh, okay, Wait, I can do it. I can do it. There we go. Um, is um, to talk a little bit about the Creative Futures Grant Program. So this this is the wow, aren't we amazing moment. Um, right, Creative Futures Grant um, is was our advocacy agenda last year. Um, I want to really call out Patty and Amy um, and the former ED at the the Arts Council, uh, Karen Middleman, um, for truly incredible work with Stephanie Jerome and others in the legislature to create this um, really remarkable largest ever investment um, in the Vermont creative sector that we've ever had. It's a nine million dollar grant program. Um, Go learn about it. If your organization or your creative sector business has not applied for a grant yet, the next round is open on January 5th. Um, round one is closed. Um, and I think notifications are maybe going out tomorrow um, or by the by the end of the week, certainly before the end of the year break. Um, and um, this was huge. And it took a tremendous amount of work, both you know by the advocacy committee of the Vermont Creative Network, but also by all of you um, who spent a fair amount of time um, reaching out to and discussing the need for this program, this $9 million investment, with your legislators. Um, so it's really, really important. Um, and it has real results. Um, and the great thing about this is that of the 115 to 20 people that were around last year in the legislature for this, they really got familiar with the kind of language that we use. Um, and they are now speaking our language. And you hear them talking about the creative sector and you hear them using our terminology um, in real ways that are very different from the way that they talked about the creative sector even just a couple of years ago. Um, so that's really key. Um, I'm gonna switch over to a little practical thing right now and say the Vermont General Assembly website is your friend. Um, and you can use this um, to find all kinds of things, right? The, the top line menu here includes the ability to search for bills, uh, to search for legislators, to search for members of committees. You can check the status of any particular legislation that you might be interested in. You can look up reports and research that were commissioned by the legislature. Um, and you know, most importantly, if you don't know who your legislator is, you can go to find a legislator and you can search for them by town. So let's say I live in Irisburg. I could just go up here and I can type Irisburg and click on that. Uh, and it should tell me that Catherine Sims, oops, I need to resubmit, what? Don't fail me, legislative website. Um, that uh, that here are our folks for Irisburgs. I guess Catherine Sims is no longer an Irisburg rep, sorry. I thought I was gonna get her, but it tells you who your two senators are for Essex Orleans district and who, who your two representatives are. Um, and I guess, you know, if, if we had to pick somebody that wasn't Catherine Sims to come up, bringing up Michael Marcotte is, uh, is, a, is a good person. He's a great ally to the creative community. Um, and honestly, uh, uh, Senator Page is pretty conservative, or sorry, Representative Page is very conservative, um, but he also cares about local communities and, um, and, and understands a little bit about what the arts and culture bring uh, to his district as well. So I think I would, I would note that just because somebody has an R next to their name or a D next to their name, don't make assumptions about where they land on community development, um, arts and culture, and the importance of the creative sector. Uh, because very often you'll find uh, that people you think you might be dis in, di in disagreement with, you'll have a lot, of, lot in common with. Um, that's, that's really, really important. And that leads me to say that, you know, one of our biggest messages this year is gratitude, right? They are speaking our language. They do care about us. They do understand the importance of these 41,000 Vermonters working in this sector and the importance that we bring to community development in local towns. Um, and we wanna say thank you um, to all of the people who worked on the bill last year. Um, and we wanna say welcome and thank you to all of the new people who have uh, volunteered their time 
um, to join in this crazy process. They will be overwhelmed. Um, it will be very hard. There are all kinds of crazy things about seniority that are strange for new people coming in. Um, and they, they want friends and we can be their friends, um, right? It's really pretty simple. It's about relationships. Um, it's, this is, is not a scary thing. Um, it really is about relationships. So three messages, gratitude, uh, friendships, relationships, welcoming, um, and education, helping the new folks to also become familiar with the language that's in the Create Vermont Action Plan. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about our, our very modest legislative priorities for this year, um, and then I'm, I'm going to close with just a, a, a little glimpse at the federal situation, right? We're talking mostly about the state today, um, but I don't want to forget um, the beginning of Patty's presentation with um, Becca Balint joining Congress, Peter Welch jumping up into Senator Leahy's seat. Um, so just, you know, very briefly, um, our very modest goals for this year uh, are to um, continue to seek support for the Vermont Creative Network with a $150,000 grant um, that will support the maintenance of the Vermont Creative Network, will support our staffing, support the zone agents working around the state um, to keep that plan moving forward at both the local and the state level. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, the second one is to increase the art and state buildings uh, program, um, which has been at $50,000 annually um, for mm, what, 30 years, Johanna? It's a crazy long amount of time it's been at $50,000. Um, $50,000 might have been a little bit meaningful then, although it was probably small then too. Um, we're asking for a very modest increase to $75,000. Um, and what this does is ensure that when there are state capital projects, um, that that uh, arts um, and artists are uh, supported to have their work in the buildings. Um, and then finally, um, a very modest increase in the appropriation for my agency, uh, Vermont Humanities, um, as one of the key grant makers in the state to, to continue to increase our community grant making program. Um, we have we have been ramping up our regular grant making program for a bunch of years, as has the Arts Council. I, I hope you've all noticed it. Um, and um, we would like to be able to continue to do that, especially in lieu of the ARPA grants and the CARES Act grants that are wrapping up now and won't be available in the future. So I know the Arts Council and the Humanities Council feel quite strongly that we need to continue to provide grant making support to our sector. Um, and we're hoping that the state will agree with us. Um, so those are our three priorities for the year. And then very briefly, I just want to um, point out, and I'm using the Federation of State Humanities Councils as uh, the example here, but there's also Americans for the Arts, right, that you know about that does the same thing. Um, the Federation of State Humanities Councils supports the 54 state and jurisdictional humanities councils and lobbies Congress for uh, appropriations for the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Uh, those appropriations represent most of the federal money that flows to the states for grant making to the creative sector in Vermont and other places. Um, starting a few years ago, um, I'll, I'll just take credit for this, the New England councils started really pushing for significant increases in support for the NEH and the NEA. Um, they'd generally been getting increases in the realm of, you know, a couple million dollars a year, maybe one and a half million dollars. Um, and we went out with a big ask several years ago saying, you know, if you'd kept up with inflation, the high point of NEH, NEA funding was in 1984 uh, under Lynn Cheney at the, and President Reagan. Um, you may recall that there was a little kerfluffle about um, certain artists um, getting NEA funding and it caused a big cutback at NEA and NEH. Um, it was queer artists, in case you don't remember, um, and it, it uh, almost cost the NEA its existence. Um, if we had kept up with that high point from the mid 80s, um, we would now be looking at annual appropriations of around $325 million a year for each agency. Um, instead, we've been sort of limping along somewhere between 150 and 160, which frankly is pocket change. 
uh, to the federal budget. Um, it's a rounding error. Um, but we did manage to get it up in the last couple of years to 180. Um, and our ask this year is uh, for 204, which would be a very significant increase from three years ago and would result in a, uh, a really significantly larger pool of grant making dollars for both the Vermont Arts Council and the Vermont Humanities Council uh, in the future. Um, you all, if you've been following the national news, you know that the federal budget is really hard to pass, but they just did agree on a top line number yesterday for the FY23 budget. Um, and our advocates in the House are advocating for actually higher than our 204 ask for 207, which was in the House passed version of the budget. Um, Senator Leahy's committee in the Senate came in at 195. Hopefully we'll land somewhere in the middle, maybe at 204. Um, it's also quite possible that competing priorities means that we'll be less than uh, those numbers and we'll see. Um, but the hope is to pass the budget and send it to the president's desk before the Christmas break. Um, and that's probably good news uh, if they can manage to get that omnibus budget out before the new Congress comes in in January. I'm going to stop there and we have about uh, 15 minutes for Q&A and discussion. I want to give a huge thank you to Patty and to Christopher for joining us today. You have both been phenomenal presenters on the lay of the land in the legislature, the creative economy, how the Arts Council and the Humanities Council, as well as other arts and cultural organizations collaborate together. I'm also going to take a second to say thank you so much to our closed captioner and all of the folks who have made sure that this presentation is wonderfully accessible. I'm going to turn off the recording before we get into the Q&A section, just in case there's anything that's a little sensitive that folks want to ask or something that's just really specific to your space. Uh, but thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, before I turn off the recording, this will end up on our website and we'll make sure to share it with you all afterwards. Thanks so much.